Without further ado, I would like to introduce Bill Carmody. Bill is the CEO of TrayPoint, and uh, he, he's asked me to uh, remind everybody in the audience of a few key points. First of all, Bill Carmody has had an epic year so far, or I guess the last 12 months, and um, he's actually got around pretty well. So he stood shoulder to shoulder with none other than Tony Robbins, who rang the NASDAQ opening bell this year, which was awesome. He's flown down to Brazil, where he delivered a keynote for a top e-commerce company called Vtex. He interviewed Richard Branson, who's a big name. I assume you know who he is. And to top it off, he was recognized as a top 100 sales influencer by social metrics agency Tenfold. So today he's going to talk about how to be irreplaceable in the kind of new era of artificial intelligence, among other things. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Bill. Thank you. Appreciate it, Scott. Thanks. All right. Yes, excellent. So uh, first of all, I want to say thank you for having me here today. I really appreciate it. Um, as you can see on the first slide, if you want a copy of these slides, you can send an email to bill at tradepoint.com. I'm happy to send it to you uh, and at this presentation. So uh, hint, if you want them, you can do that right now if you want. Um, so just a little background, the, my name is Bill Carmody and the purpose of my life is to be an inspirational leader that solves problems and creates breakthroughs for myself and others. Yes! I'll tell you why I did that in a little bit. Uh, as, a, as a life leadership uh, coach, one of the things I do is I work with world-changing visionaries to help them create a better future. So when I think about irreplaceable, I can't help it. I think about Beyonce, to the left, to the left, everything known in the box to the left. Isn't that what we're trying to do here is not be replaced? If you think about it for a second, the biggest fear in any job is being asked to come into someone's office with all your belongings in a box, right? We don't want that. We want to be irreplaceable. And today, I'm going to talk to you about how to do just that. So how does that feel to walk out of today's session being irreplaceable? See, that's what I'm talking about. Let me try that again. You're going to get out of this session what you put into it. So if you're sitting there and you're texting your friends and you're doing email, uh, you know what? The definition of multitasking is doing several things poorly. So be here now. Let me ask again. At the end of this session, you're going to be able to be irreplaceable. How does that sound? Yes. That's what I'm talking about. Here's the thing. I had an amazing opportunity to talk to one of the writers for Crane's uh, business, and I asked him about what makes Detroit special, because I'm from New York. I'm actually originally from California, but I'm not from here. And I know Detroit people like Detroit people, and I'm not one of the tribe. So I asked him, what's up? Tell me about, well, I'm going to go talk about artificial intelligence. I'm going to talk about big data. I know it from the industry, but tell me what's important here in Detroit. He said, well, there's a couple things. He goes, number one, let's talk about the biggest industries. Start with healthcare. I'm fascinated by healthcare because if I were to buy a car the way I they charge for healthcare, I'd walk into the dealership, pick any car I want, drive it off a lot, and in three months get a bill and figure out how much I paid for it. <laughs> it's insane, right? That's crazy. I mean, you, there are actually higher risk when you go into a hospital than when you started and came out of it, right? There are people that draw, like if they're having a, a surgery, they draw a big Sharpie X. This is the leg, people. This is where I want you to do the operation. Don't mess up my other knee, right? That's where we're at right now in healthcare. So obviously what's exciting about that is all the change that's coming because we only got up from here, right? And what I love about it is, is that when you start to think about biometric data, my Apple Watch, it knows how many calories I burn. It knows how long I'm standing versus sitting. But what's really exciting is it's taking a, a track of my heartbeat. And as a male, I know when I'm, I'm now 45 years old, as I continue to age, my number one risk is heart attack. Isn't it be awesome that my Apple Watch saves me from that and actually says, hey, Bill, you should go to the doctor like really soon because you have an irregular heartbeat and you probably should have that checked out. Like that's amazing. That's big data. That's when big data turns on us. It has nothing to do with big companies. See, for so long, I worked with companies helping them figure out big data relative to their customers. But what excites me is when big data is being used on the individual because it changes everything. That's exciting in healthcare. What's exciting for me about this, the auto industry, is when I was a kid, the car was an extension of yourself. 
right? From the color of the car to the make, the model, it was basically a representation of your brand. But never before has the car been an extension of your data. And that's what's cool. The idea that, you know, Lear, for example, is in the biometric business, biometric data, Lear. The guys that make the car seats are in the biometric data business because they're actually gonna be able to tell you what's going on. They also, just like the Apple Watch, they can tell if you're about to have a heart attack. Maybe you shouldn't be behind the wheel right now. If we wanted to actually eliminate drunk driving, well, we could just go to driverless cars, but besides that, we could also do it with basically biometric data, right? I can say with your location services, I see you're standing outside of a bar, so before you can start the engine, why don't you go ahead and breathe into this thing, right? And we'll see if you blow higher than you, you're legally allowed to drive, and the engine just won't start. My point is we can solve some really awesome problems in our lifetime. And what does that mean for the government, this third industry? What does it mean when the majority of cars are self-driving? What does that mean for infrastructure? What does that mean for urban planning? You know, what, what, what's the value of a parking lot when cars can just drive themselves around all day long and you don't need them anymore? Do we even need to own a car? These are really cool, powerful questions and they're all happening right here. This is why Detroit is so exciting. You know, recently I bought a ring. If you're familiar with ring, you, you press the button and of course it has a picture of you. But what I didn't realize before I bought it was it's motion detected. So when I was a kid, I used to sneak up to people's doors, ding dong, and run away, right? Can't get away with that anymore. Because as I'm approaching the door, video, immediately. In fact, what's cool for government agencies is when I signed up for ring, it said, hey, do you wanna be part of the neighborhood watch program? Don't worry, you don't have to do anything. You don't have to like go to any meetings or anything like that. We just want to connect your ring to the rest of Port Washington where I live. So that way, if there's any crime in the neighborhood, we can take your video feeds and send them to the police. Are you cool with that? Hell yeah, I'm cool with that. It changes the way we actually think about government agencies, policing, and everything else. So that to me is exciting, but it also is terrifying. You know, it's terrifying, isn't it? The line between creepy and cool is really thin, really thin. And I'll tell you, if you're an Uber driver right now, it's kind of scary. If you're a delivery driver, it's kind of scary. You know, in fact, if you drive a vehicle for a living, you should be thinking about other options, right? You go to the car shows and this is what you see, you know, the, these seats facing themselves. It's gonna, this is awesome and terrifying. It's awesome because I will never have my driver's license taken away from me. Or if I do, I'll still have transportation. You know, and my mom, she got too old, she couldn't drive. You know, she had her driver's license taken away. She's got a bus pass now. That sucks. But for me, I'm gonna always have the option to press a button and have a car show up. That's awesome, right? So that's the first part of things. I wanna talk about AI in the context of how incredible and powerful it is, but also what it does for us, meaning, when I start to think about artificial intelligence, it's understanding just the sea of data. It used to be corporate, now it's coming to the consumer side. How do I actually go through my own data? How do I leverage my own insights, right? All of this is changing. It doesn't matter if you're not in one of those industries we just talked about. Every company is in two businesses. You're in the digital disruption business and whatever business you think you're in. Right? If you understand data and you understand artificial intelligence, you understand the power that it yields in every industry. Now, there's a lot of people that focus on dashboards here in this conference, and I love it. You're visualizing data. Visualizing data is awesome. But here's the thing. I'm working with a company right now called Sam.ai, and I don't have to actually look at any of these charts anymore. Do you know what I do? Alexa. Tell me which inside salesperson needs my help today. Alexa, which customers have I not spent enough time with this month? Alexa, where should I be focusing my sales energy right now? This is real. This isn't some futuristic thing. I'm testing it right now. It's not rolled out yet, but it's in beta. And what's in beta becomes real, real quick. So I love those charts. Don't get me wrong, there'll always be a need for those charts but how we're gonna operate as business owners is we're gonna be asking questions and getting answers like we do in real life. That's terrifying and exciting. So I wrote this article I posted up yesterday uh, in Cranes, Detroit, how big data and AI can attract and retain Gen Z talent in Detroit. 
This is the other macro trend I want to talk about. When we talk about being irreplaceable, I want to tell you there's been a lot of conversation about millennials, but not nearly enough conversation about Gen Z. Gen Z is the generation after the millennials, okay? Here's what we know about them. They're digitally native. My five-year-old son was pissed when we went to a hotel and couldn't pause television. <laughs> what do you mean you can't? I gotta go to the bathroom, stop the show. I wanna see this show, I don't wanna miss anything. No, what do you mean? What's live TV, what is that? That's archaic. What are we, cavemen, right? That's his life. He slides across the iPad. He knew how to use an iPad and taught my wife things to do on an iPad she didn't know how to do. He's five. That's what it means to be digitally native. They're private. Unlike millennials, they don't want to live their life on Facebook. They're very private people. They want to talk amongst their group and their, and their clubs, but they don't want to basically be public with everything they do. They see how that turned out. They're also independent, right? They, they, they like to, to be with their group and their, their tribe, and they're very diverse. These are the kids that grew up with anti-bullying to the extreme. These are the kids that got trophies just for showing up, right? <laughs> so inclusion is really important to them. Right? We're an inclusive group, right? So that's great. It's going to help with diversity, but it has some re re repercussions. They're also money focused. You know, they understand that it is about making sure that there's enough money to go around and they're getting their fair share. They're very well connected and they're fast paced. What's next? Come on. These are the people that never had a CD. Everything was streaming, right? Press button, go. Press button, go. They see the spinning wheel, well, the machine's broken. What's latency? I don't know what that is. It's like, whatever, press button, go, right? That's how it is. That's how they work, too. Fast, 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 right? And they're career-oriented. They know what they want to accomplish. Unlike the millennials who are looking for five careers in their lifetime, not five jobs, five careers, Gen Z is focused. They tend to go after one thing and do it really, really well. So think about that for a second. We got two macro trends. We got AI and big data coming fast and, and furious. And you got the next generation of workers that are hungry and focused. Now do you realize why it's important to be irreplaceable in, a, in an AI world? This is what we're talking about. This is why you're here. This is why we're having this conversation. So there's all kinds of additional information on Gen Z if you want it. You can go out there. It's, it's all there. I love these stats, you know, talking about the 4 billion views on YouTube or the uh, 5 billion searches they do every day. That's all great. But really, it's just understanding that this is what's coming and it's coming in fast and hot. So, how do we become irreplaceable? That is the question of the hour. In order to be irreplaceable, one must always be different. And that leads to the question, different how? So, we're gonna do a little work today. Everybody, bring out your little notebooks. I know you have one, because you got one when you registered. I want you to take out your notebook, and I want you to write down I want you to think back to the last few times when someone has said to you, I wish that I could do that as easily and as effortlessly as you seem to do it. What did you do that they were commenting on? I want you to write down five or six things that others do, I'm sorry, that others have admired you for the ease in which you do them. Five or six things that you do that others have admired you for the ease in which you do them. Take about a minute. Another 20 seconds, finish up. If you have at least five, raise your hand. Five, if you have at least five things that you do that others have admired you for the ease in which you do them, raise your hand. Handful, okay, another five seconds. This is important because the next step is going to require that you have something written down. 
So hopefully you did the exercise. All right. What's your superpower? I'm giving you that first exercise because I want you to think about this and I want you to answer it authentically. What is your superpower? I love to be here on stage. It's my passion. I love public speaking. It's one of my favorite things in the whole world. But most people are terrified to do it. So to, to them, this is a superpower, right? Wow, God, that's awesome. I know how to get people published in the magazines they want to be in. That's a superpower. I know how to create breakthroughs in people's lives. That's a superpower. What's your superpower? You just wrote five things down that you do easily. Take another look at that list. Which one is your superpower? Or two, or three, or maybe all five. Let me give you some examples of some really awesome superpowers. Problem solving. When you guys think about the context of data, it's not about the data. It's never about the chart. It's what's the problem that you're solving, right? That is a superpower. If you can take reams of data, like our keynote speaker at lunch talked about, get it all massaged out real time and turn that into insights, that's a superpower. Can you deliver a breakthrough for your business or your, your company or your client? Help them understand the problem that they're, ch they're challenged with and help them with a breakthrough. Uh, Peter Thiel, uh, the, the ability to, uh, to recalibrate what's possible, looking at a challenge and seeing it from a different perspective and figure out how to create a breakthrough and recalibrate what's possible. Peter Thiel wrote, identifying a unique opportunity that others don't see, the concept of zero to one. Can you see stuff that others don't see, right? If you can see things others don't see, that's a superpower. Not paying for conferences that you love to attend. Shh, don't tell Kayat I told you this one. Shh, no, no, don't tell anyone. I've been public speaking for 20 years. What I realized was is it's more valuable for me to help put butts in seats than it is for me to pay for a conference. True? So what I realized was any conference that I want to actually go to, I just have to fill out the form to be a speaker or to cover it as a media event, right, as a blogger. And in both cases, it always works out really well. And that's a superpower. I don't have to pay for conferences ever again. Awesome. Getting a company published in their favorite publication, that's a superpower. Connecting with people you most admire. You heard in the very beginning, I'll talk a little bit more about Tony Robbins, Richard Branson. Being able to connect with those guys, that's badass, right? That's a superpower. Connecting to other people to other people, your own network. Being a connector is by itself a superpower. Public speaking, writing. How about everything you just wrote down, right? Take a look at that list. If you want to know how to be irreplaceable, it starts here. It starts with understanding your superpower. It's not understanding, like I could say, I have a skill in putting presentations together, but that's not my superpower. Public speaking, being able to move people to action, being able to get people excited about what they love and what they do, that's a superpower. PowerPoint is not. I mean, yeah, it's a skill, but I can go on to Fiverr and have somebody else do it for me, right? I can outsource that. So if your job can be replaced by Fiverr, it's not a superpower, right? That said, anybody who actually has a skill that other people admire is a superpower. So I'm contradicting myself here. But the point is, is that if you know how to do something others admire, that's something that you can add tremendous value to. So we live in a world of disposable things, but you are not one of them. You are irreplaceable, one in the kind, and, and, uh, and there will never be another you. You are not disposable. Do not let anyone or anyone, anything tell you differently. So two years ago in 2015, I had a, a, a coach, leadership coach, ask me a really powerful question. He said, if your life was a movie, would anyone pay to see it? Wow, what a great question. If your life were a movie, would anyone pay to see it? And I had to say no, honestly. I said, you know what? I'm kind of an extra in other people's lives and other movies, right? I know these other people that I work with, I'm kind of the extra in their movie. I'm doing great as an extra, but you're right. I'm not living legendary. That's, that's, that's an interesting question. And I was thinking about this even after we'd been on the Inc. 5000 two years in a row. And we were number 83rd fastest growing public company in New York. And yet I realized something was missing. Hell, I could see financial freedom just ahead. I'm like, that's exciting, right? But it wasn't making me happy. And I wasn't really tapping into my superpowers. 
So I asked myself, when was I most happy in my life? And I came up with a really interesting answer. It was in Toronto, Canada. And I had been on an airplane flown out by IBM. And I was realizing on the plane, I didn't have a dinner meeting, but my flight was paid for, my hotel was paid for, all my meals were paid for. Wow, that's magical. And I'm going to this place that I've never been to before, and I have all these things already taken care of me and for me. So I decided to do something that night, something I'd never done. I decided, I calculated that it would be somewhere between seven and $800 that I would have spent if I'd done all that stuff myself. Paid for my own flight, bought my own hotel, bought my own meals. And I went to the ATM and I extracted all that money in Canadian dollars, and because there was a difference, it was like over a thousand bucks in Canadian dollars, right? Seven, eight hundred dollars US. And I decided to do something really unique. You know how you walk down the street and a homeless man says, spare some change? You're like, oh, I'm so busy. No, no, sorry, don't talk to me. No. I decided to do something different. I decided to say yes. And what I did was, I said, anyone who asked me for money, I sat down and I said, yes, I just want to hear your story. Tell me your story. What got you here? And the first person that I talked to, uh, he had sold his house so that he could put his daughter to college. He couldn't afford to send his daughter to college, and so he sold his house, and his daughter didn't know. He had a cell phone in his pocket, so he was always available. When she'd call, they'd talk. She still thinks he's living in that house. He's on the street. He still has a job. He would go get a shower at the gym, had his clothes there, and he was homeless. And I remember after I gave him a couple hundred bucks, you know, this is a thing, you know, thank you for sharing your story. He said, you know, I, I prayed tonight that, that I have a sign that I did the right thing because I wonder, you know, I'm out on the street, that I do the right thing to send my, my daughter through college. And I feel like I just got the answer I was looking for. Sorry. <laughs> um, and, uh, and so uh, what I said to him, though, was is that you gave me a, a much greater gift because I realized how lucky I really had it. And I spent the rest of that night hearing more and more powerful stories. I spoke to a gal who had left because her mom's boyfriend was molesting her and her mom wouldn't believe her, so she decided to live on the street because she could at least be safe with her tribe. These were powerful stories and they really did something to me. So I decided to bring that back I'm a youth group uh, for the Unitarian Universalist Congregation. I've always had a youth group. I brought it back and we actually did Midnight Run. And I took all these youth to go help distribute clothes and food and stuff, but it wasn't about the distribution. I told them the story that I just shared with you and I said, this, this is about bringing humanity back, having conversations with people, hearing their stories, right? And that's what got me started. And I started thinking about what is it to live legendary? What is it to basically get to that higher level that I always aspire to? So for me, the hardest thing I could imagine was an Ironman, right? 140.6 miles. It's 2.4 mile swim, 112 mile bike, and a full marathon. Guess what? When I decided to do this, I had never run a marathon. Yeah, crazy, right? My friend's like, you'll never do that. It's not possible. You cannot do that. And I said, you know what? I know that anything is possible if I put my mind to it. And I figure if this is the hardest thing I can think of, if I can accomplish this, well, then I can accomplish anything. And so it was with my family, right? It certainly helped me out. And we even went on an RV trip before the Ironman so I could basically celebrate my time with them. And it was really fun, right? Did all this great stuff. And then I went on a whitewater rafting trip in Costa Rica. This was my way of saying, hey, if I'm gonna make my own movie, then I get to write the script, here's my script. And while, something amazing happened while I was out there. I got a phone call, uh, and actually I got from an email from Tony Robbins' publicist and said, hey, are you going to be back in the States on Tuesday? Because we'd love to have you stand up and, and stand next to Tony Robbins as he opens the NASDAQ opening bell. So there I am. Ariana Huffington, Tony Robbins, oh yeah, Bill Carmody. What the hell? My point of this is, this is not about me. I'm telling you this story because this is what it means to know your superpower and to leverage it greatly. I've been in digital marketing for 24 years. I built some of the first commercial websites. I did a lot of cool things, but I didn't tap my superpower until about two years ago. And when I did, it all changed. How do you become irreplaceable? 
you have to know your superpower and leverage the hell out of it. So I'll give you a quick example. If you were to go Google Tony Robbins' How to Retire Rich, this is what you're going to find. You're going to find an Inc. article that I wrote and my interview with Tony Robbins. That connection, that was allowing me to leverage that superpower. Same thing with Richard Branson. They said in there, that there was nothing special here. What happened was I had written an article about uh, the top e-commerce companies for 2017, and it got published in Inc. This company, Vtex, called me up and said, hey, I want the same thing for help us promote your company. Boom, did all that, and they had me flow me down so I could give a keynote speech and actually meet Richard Branson. I just tapped my superpower. So if you're willing to do what's easy, life will be hard. But if you're willing to do what's hard, life will be easy. That T. Harv Eckert wrote The uh, Success of the Millionaire Mind. And the thing that I find so important about this is it is about what you do when you're not working. I spent 1,500 hours putting together 340 articles on Inc. unpaid. But that's my superpower. Right? It gave me all these other amazing things. So I, that's why I'm asking you, what's your superpower? What is it? So how will you become irreplaceable in an AI world? How will you become replaceable? We already talked about the first one. Clearly identify your superpower. Do you have it? Do you know your superpower? Nod yes, nod no. Yeah, no. Yes? If you have your superpower, you've accomplished step one. Step two? is understanding how to leverage that superpower as hard as you possibly can and get really great at it so that you can get back to step two, which is, what's your why? So the second thing I'm going to ask you, I'm only asking you to do three things tonight, right? Number one, you already did. You talked about your superpower. Number two, what is your why? Why must you be successful? Write that down. Tell me, why must you be successful? Not should. Don't should all over yourself. Tell me well, your why. Why is it a must? Why must you be successful? Here's my why. I know that I'm going to do more for others than I'll ever do for myself. And I want to be an example for my kids. That's my why. When my kids can look at me and say, I want to be more like that, that fulfills me. That lights me up. That makes me don't want to work harder every single day. Whatever your why is, it should propel you forward. Because this stuff is not easy, is it? What you're about to do takes extra work. It's the difference between Netflix and spending time like uh, on lynda.com, right? It's learning new skills, getting better, getting stronger, and strengthening your, your muscles. You have to have that why to pull you through. Success is an iceberg, right? People see the top. They see me going, being flown down to uh, interview Richard Branson. That's super cool. It is. It is. But it's not what I did to get there. It's all the stuff underneath. It's your focus, your goals, your persistence, your failure, your sacrifice, your habits, and your hard work. That's underneath the iceberg. That's how you become irreplaceable, is by having all of this so that it shows up at the top, but it's all the work down beneath that makes you irreplaceable. So this is your final step. This is the final step, which is setting goals for yourself that truly matter. If you find yourself being an extra in somebody else's movie, it's because of this. It's because you're focusing on the execution of someone else's goals. If you truly want to be irreplaceable, you got to set goals for yourself, and you have to make them smart, right? Specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-bound. If you have a smart goal that you know you can accomplish, whether it's in one month, three months, six months, or a year, that's moving you toward where you want to end up, right? So this last step that I want you guys to do is write down what is that one goal you want to accomplish, whether it's by the end of this year, the next three months, you set the time. But write that down. Please do that now. This is the last thing I'm going to ask you to do, I promise.
So what I want to say about this last part is that what you get by achieving your goals is not as important as what you become by achieving your goals. And what I mean by that is, is that when you think about it from the context of what you must do to become that person is more valuable than actually achieving the goal. If you ever come to a goal and you're like, is that it? <laughs> you know, when that happens, it's because you've already become the other person in the process of achieving that goal. So some of the best advice I've ever received so, uh, is when you sort of look at, are you the main character in your movie? And if your answer is no, you wanna basically figure out what you're gonna to do to get there. And if you take five seconds and think about what are the first few steps that you need to take to achieve that goal? This was some of the best advice I got from Tony Robbins. Never leave a site of a goal without first taking some form of positive action toward attainment. Right now, if you take a moment to define those first steps you must take to achieve some goal, what can you do today to move forward? So this is part 3A, <laughs> which is basically you wrote down the goal. What are just a few quick things you could do today, tonight, this week, just to get momentum? Because that's the last part of this. If you have a very clearly defined goal, you know exactly what your why is, you have clear, crisp identification of your superpowers, you will attain it. If you just have a little bit of momentum, success begets more success. I couldn't do an Ironman until I finished a marathon, right? I couldn't do a marathon until I actually did some actual running classes, right? So there's steps. What are the steps? You're not going to scale Mount Everest on the first try. You know, there's work that has to be done between that. So as I mentioned, if you want a copy of these slides, you can, send, you can actually email me or you can actually go on to LinkedIn on SlideShare and you can actually type in the name of this presentation and how to be irreplaceable in an AI world. But that's not my gift to you. My gift to you, for every one of you who stayed late, who came, went to the last keynote session, I want to give every single one of you a gift. And that gift is, if you would like to go deeper in any of the stuff you just heard, any of the things you just wrote down, any of that work, I want to give you a free one-hour session, coaching session, so that you can go as deep as you want to go. You can accomplish a lot and breakthroughs and solve any problem in one session. It's powerful stuff. That's my gift to you. Now, wait, wait, wait. Is anyone brave enough to share what they wrote down? You did the work. Is anyone willing to make a public declaration based on how they're going to become irreplaceable? Yes. What? Can we, do we have a mic? Sorry, do we have a hand mic? Or you can just say it and I'll repeat it. Go ahead. Hello? Okay. Yes. I read a lot of poetry. And every time, wherever we go, whatever we do, and we need to write something very beautiful, everybody comes back to me, Sophia, can you write something about this, something about that? I want you to write something emotional, something related to this, related to that. Um, recently, uh, for uh, one of our friends, related to the situation she had, I had to write you know, a page of something, relevant, beautiful, so it just, I sit down in a matter of minutes, I can write it. And I've had a very difficult life, and my mother-in-law constantly told me, Sophia, write a book. Write all this stuff. Collect, collect them together. But I have no idea for what reason I'm afraid. And I cannot put them all together and start writing. That's it. Okay, so, if, first of all, what was your name? Sophia. Sophia. So, Sophia, what you're saying is, generally speaking, when you want to sit down, you can bang out anything you want. Yeah, I mean, small things. Yeah. Very small things. But when you sit down to write an entire book, there's a block. Completely. Okay. There is so much to say that I have, and I don't know which one to start. As soon as I start, actually I started a few times. As soon as I wrote something, then I jumped into something else. Then I jumped in. So I didn't know how to collect my thoughts and say, okay, just get st you know, start writing on this and then go. So I can't. So I my sister is really pissed at me. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to ask you a question. How do you eat an elephant? I've never had that. How do you <laughs> eat an elephant? I don't know. Who knows the answer? How do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. 
here's my question to you. Did you take the time to write an outline? Uh, no. Start there. Here's the thing. If you can do it in small pieces, the first step is write the outline, the bones. Don't try to write the whole story. Start, write the arc, right? Start with just what was the story you want to tell. Not the whole thing, just in bullet points. If you have 18 chapters, write the headline for each chapter. That's it. Just do that and look at it and say, you know what each bullet point means without ever writing it. Give yourself that first momentum. The hardest part about writing a book is starting. You've already tried that. But if you have the target and you know exactly what the outcome is going to be from your outline, it'll mo propel you to move forward because you won't get stuck. In fact, if you bounce, you can bounce from chapter one to chapter eight because eight's really feeling it today. That's okay. You can go back and rewrite it later. But if you have the entire outline, you'll be able to see the picture clearly of what you want to actually accomplish in the book. Does that help? Yeah. Cool. Hey, give her a hand. Thank you. <laughs> How about someone who's looking to be irreplaceable in an AI world? If you're looking at sort of what you do as your superpower, I want to hear what's your superpower? What did you come up with? Who's got a superpower they want to share? Yes. Please state your name and tell me your superpower. Uh, you Seema? get the mic right there. Mike. Okay. Hi, I'm Seema, and Hi, Seema. Uh, I believe my superpower is connecting with people. Great. You're a connector. Okay, now take that. What was the next thing you wrote? So what's your why? My why is uh, I'm dreaming about uh, my own BI team. Yes. Uh, and that's where I'm going to use my power and uh, achieve what I dream for. So and BI team and come up with a solution which will be uh, beneficial for the society. And what's your must? Why is that a must? My must is my passion for students. Yes. And do something for uh, students in, in the education sector. That's, that has been my passion since I was a student. Nice. So uh, that's what you know, motivates me. Fantastic. Give her a hand, please. It's awesome. Did anyone like to share something they learned today? This doesn't have to be your superpower, just something you learned, something you picked up, something you didn't know when you started. Yes. Say your name, please. Hi, uh, my name is Tri Lok. Uh, the thing, the big takeaway from your presentation is it's what you become is more important than what you achieve yes. by doing it. That's a point of realization for me. That's awesome. Give him a hand. Thank you very much, Mike. That's great. Anybody else? You pick up a little pearl you want to share? Yes, please. One second. We'll get to the mic. Sorry. This gentleman right here. Hi, my name is Sean. Um, actually, I picked up two things. The first one is multitasking. is doing several things poorly. Yes. And... <laughs> The second one is, um, if, you're, if my life was a movie, would anyone pay to see it? Yes, nice. Give him a hand. Thank you, Sean. Awesome. Is there any other question? Like, is there something that if you came into this session, you thought, God, I really hope he answers this, and we didn't get to it today. We still have a few minutes left. Is there anything that you wanted to get out of this session that you didn't get out of the session? A question you have or something you wanted us to dig deeper into? Yes, sir. How do you handle, or how do you go about uh, a doubt that you have when you start something, if you are able to finish it or not? Yes. How do you handle that? Yes. How many of us have saboteurs? That little voice inside our head that says, you can't do that. There's no way you're going to do that. You can't do that. Yeah. I'll tell you, the most effective strategy I've ever had is name that voice when it shows up. Name it. So my power is unstoppable, right? When I go, yes, that's unstoppable. That's, that's my persona of power that I use when I go on stage, right? It gets me fired up, it gives me energy, and I'm able to give it out. I also have Depressing Dan. And Depressing Dan shows up all the time. He's like, dude, shit's not working out. God damn it, right? <laughs> Name Depressing Dan, right? So when Depressing Dan shows up, I can say hi to him. Hey, Depressing Dan, what's going on? It's not me. That's not me. I'm unstoppable. That's depressing Dan. But he, depressing Dan has a purpose. And the purpose of that doubt is survival. 
the idea is our brains were wired for survival, not for happiness, right? Well, the reason we survived as a species was we could run when something bad was charging at us, right? That's what that voice is, but it no longer serves us. But the problem is, if we listen to it, it becomes where we focus. So do an exercise with me. Take, take an OK symbol and stick it out in front of your hand. Right, good, perfect. Look around, right? If everyone could do this, look around. What do you see? Everything inside that little circle, that's the 2% you're doing wrong. Everything outside that circle is the 98% you're doing right. Now watch this. This is what happens with depressing Dan. Pull it in, pull it in, pull it in, pull it in. So I'm looking right here. And then I go, and that's all I focus on, right? Close my left eye, and there we go. That's what happens with that voice. Because perfection is the absolute weakest standard because it is unattainable. And that little voice wants perfection, but it's not possible. So the, the thing is to lift it out and look at it in perspective. And that feeling of doubt is really coming down from a place of, there's something more important going on. And yes, this serves a purpose because it's a place where I can continue to improve, but never forget the 98% of all the stuff you're doing awesome. Does that answer your question? Good, give me a hand. We have time for one more. Anybody else? Sorry. Who? Raise your hand. Oh. Wait, it's, yeah, please. Go ahead, sir. My name is Mohammed Usman. Mm -hmm. uh, I always learn that no one is indispensable, but today uh, what I'm hearing from you is that you can consider yourself as indispensable yes. in certain aspect. And uh, uh, do you have a comment on that? Yeah. Uh, because uh, the, the wisdom that people have uh, around us is that one, that have, we have been taught. And so, so let, me, so let me rephrase it. The question is, is that you've been taught that everybody is replaceable. Yes. And that what everything I've just said flies in the face of that, because I'm saying if you understand your superpower and you go after it deeply, you will become irreplaceable, right? And so yes. what's the, so I'll start with the first part. Brene Brown wrote an incredible book called Daring Greatly. If you haven't read it, start there. That's a fantastic book. But really what Daring Greatly talks about is the idea of being vulnerable. We all have these fears, uncertainties, and doubts, and we are not sure. That feeling of we're all replaceable comes from the machine, right? The machine of basically like, you know, everybody has their little thing and it's totally replaceable. When I say be irreplaceable, it means you're adding so much value, it would be stupid to fire you. So what I'm getting at that point is, even if they did fire you, if you were so good at your superpower, you would immediately pick be pecked back by somebody else, right? If you get that good, then you don't have to fear ever being fired because first of all, it's unlikely to happen. But even if it did happen, you have this innate ability to go wherever you wanna go because you've really gotten in tune with that superpower. So I'm not saying that it's you're totally fireproof, like nobody will ever let you go in a job. What I'm saying is if you really work on your skill of your superpower, it is unlikely that you will be downsized or let go. And if you are, you can immediately find others that need that skill. If you can deliver more value than the compensation you're receiving, you will always be in demand. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. So it, it's all about the context in what you are considering that. So what I said in the beginning was, we have AI and big data combined with Gen Z who are chomping, all coming together as sort of a perfect storm. And if we wanna be irreplaceable in that environment, we have to be crystal clear on our superpower and do it really, really well. Because if people can recognize that, you're not likely to be the one to be replaced. You're gonna be, the people who will be replaced are the ones that have skills that they think are interchangeable like you've described. But if you have a really powerful superpower and people understand what it is, it's, really, it's, it's how you basically make yourself relevant in any environment. Good? All right, thank you very much. I appreciate your time today. Thank you, Bill. Great presentation.
Okay, so now for the extra fun part and the last part of today's conference is the door prizes. So I want to make sure that everybody who's still here, all these door prizes are you must be here to win. But uh, first and, and foremost, the most important door prize for me anyhow is please do fill out one of those yellow sheets. Let us know what you thought about today's sessions and if there's anything uh, that you think that we can do better because we absolutely positively want to do that. So uh, we'll give you a couple minutes. When you're done with yours, just hold it in the, in the air and one of our blue shirt people will come by and take it from you and give you a, a raffle ticket and then we'll pull the raffle tickets out of a hat. Oh, and if you don't have one, raise two hands and we'll come and get you one real quick. All right, and our vendors are walking up. We've got Cloudera first in line. They're the most excited to give away their door prize. I'll actually have you guys come up and announce your own. Okay, the, the click team had to leave um, early today to go to a meeting, so I will um, announce their folks for them. So this is a, an Echo Dot, an Amazon Echo Dot, and I have some names here. Um, Swami Sitharaman. All right, you are the winner. So if you want to come up and grab this, that'd be great. And I'll have our vendor partners come up individually and they can announce their winners. Is this thing on? Check one, check, good. All right, everyone, thank you uh, for coming today. We're Informatica, uh, all things data, come talk to us. We've got a party going on afterwards. If people are interested, let us know. Cloud Air partners of ours. So we've got some names. We randomly picked one out of here. Let me see if I say it properly. Is it Mickey Din um. from FCA? We're giving away, it's a Bluetooth speaker, a Bose, good stuff. Thanks everyone, appreciate it. Hello, we have a prize from Semarki, which are Bose wireless headphones. So let's select a random winner. Karina Adkins? Are you here? You are here. OK, congratulations. All right, so from Talon, we have a Bose SoundLink Revolve. And the winner is Joseph Griffin. Are you here? <laughs> All right, I'm David Waisaki with Tableau Software, and we have a winner for the Apple AirPods. Does anyone know about the AirPods? All right. Um, so we have Sarah Green from CMS Energy. Is Sarah here? 
darn. All right, let me hang on then. Let me find it. All right. I'm just going to do this. Kurt Edgar from Fiat Chrysler. Is Kurt here? There we go. All right, we have a winner. Sarah's not going to be very happy that she wasn't here. Hello, everyone. My name is Jeremy Fisher. I'm with Amazon Web Services. I promise Amazon did not sponsor everyone to give away Echoes. Uh, it's just a happy coincidence. Uh, so I do have an Echo and an Echo Dot. And our winner is Salil Katheria. Did I pronounce that correctly? Salil, all right. Thank you. I'm uh, Nathan Mohammed, representing MicroStrategy Analytics, and I'm happy to announce the winner of our Amazon Echo. And uh, today's winner is Morgan Ackerman. Is Morgan Ackerman present? Come on down. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Terry Savage from Cloudera. I'm with Lauren Champeau and John Howie. And by the way, John Howie is the most famous engineer in Detroit. Everywhere I go and he talks to the other engineers, they say, I like that guy. Now, everyone who put their name in the hat, and uh, not, not their name in the hat, who came by our booth and we scanned you. Some people were telling me, stop scanning. You've scanned enough so they could win this wonderful Yeti cooler. But uh, we did ask if someone would pull a winner for us, and we're going to see if this person's in the audience. Ramsey Bram. Is Ramsey here? <laughs> Ramsey won. Thank you. Thank this gentleman right here at this table. He's the one who pushed the winning button right there. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Hi everyone, I'm Tom Rebecca from Attunity, and uh, we have a toy, it's, it's a drone uh, for our prize, and the winner is Megan Hollowell. Well, yeah. looks like the toy's going to the right place. <laughs> All right, I like that winner. Ho hopefully, hopefully we can get somebody for the Twitter raffle. So I'm not a tweeter, but I understand that I have to read your handle. So that's that's how I'm going to announce. So Dfell underscore three. All right, come on up, Dfell. All right, A for effort. Okay, last one. So um, before we draw this last one and, and close the conference here, I want to thank my neighbor here, Erin Adair Guy. She's the, the quarterback for this whole event. She basically did everything. So I'd like to give her a round of applause. All right, so I'll, I'll blindly choose the winner here. They say that when you put your, your tickets in and when you fold these up, you're supposed to put a fold a corner, but I guess you couldn't do that with these. So, all right. And the winner, 864 Okay, I want to thank everybody again for coming out today. 
was a, a great event. I'm really you know, proud of what we've been able to do here locally with our, our own little Gartner conference here for BI. Um, have a great evening, a great year, and we'll hopefully see you next time. Thank you.